welcome to WFD Digital Debates. Tonight, um, we're going to have a discussion on... Sorry. Tonight, we're going to have a discussion on global sustainable development and equality. Um, the helping me organize the digital debate from World Speech Day has been Vinu Pillay. Uh, she is the National Ambassador and Executive Director of World Speech Day, a global speech, um, lead in World Speech Day Women, and a member of World Speech Day's Global Advisory. So she has a short introduction for us. Please tune in. To celebrate World Speech Day 2021, it gives me pleasure to introduce the World Speech Day Global Digital Debate between teams from Mexico and South Africa. In commemoration of International Women's Day this week, we have front row seats to countless speeches, dialogues and presentations on gender equality. This debate is one such example of how our future leaders are showing us the way by generating an awareness of and offering an education on vital global issues such as the importance of understanding, being aware and examining the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. More specifically, and for the purpose of today's debate, we are referring to that of gender equality. Having our youth actively engaging in dialogue that concerns issues about their future is essential to, in terms of prompting the powers that be to remain constantly engaged and accountable if humanity is to achieve the progress that it hopes for. Introducing our two teams, we have CEM Mexico, which is one of the oldest debating teams, having participated in several regional and national tournaments, including that of Mexico's. The team's most notable achievement includes making the finals for CM UDE 2020 and EFL for WUDC 2020 as well. Then we have the University of Pretoria, which has become a pivotal part of WSD South Africa since 2018, demonstrating the skillful art of debating to our youth at the annual celebration of speeches event and continuing to strengthen its efforts through in local in-house and international online debates. A very special thank you goes to our, out to our WSD organizing chair, Bla as well as Benjamin, who is from the Mexico team, for making this debate happen and for already inspiring others to follow suit. I therefore invite you to enjoy a global digital debate between two awesome teams as they debate over the sustainable development goals that they believe should be prioritized by the United Nations if gender equality is to become a reality by 2030. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so from that, we move to side selection. If I could please get a representative from each team and we're just gonna call uh, the coin toss. <laughs> just turn on your mics, I think. Um, hello. Oh, hi, I can uh, I am the representative from Texan, yeah. Okay, cool. I can hear you. Uh, can we get a representative from UPDU? Can end it? Okay, cool. So, uh, I don't know if anyone can hear me. Um, I can hear you. Who's speaking? You guys able to hear me? I'm the representative from UPDU. Oh, okay. cool, cool. Sorry, sorry. It popped up the name all right so flipping the coin um one of you can just call it then yes <laughs> heads or tails <coughs> heads heads okay yeah we've got heads <laughs> better <laughs> so then you can pick a side would you like to be proposition or opposition um we would like to be opposition Opposition. All right. So we have uh, we have Tech CM representing Mexico, who are going to be opposition, 
and uh, UPDU representing South Africa who will be proposition. What this means is proposition, you're going to prep UPDU in the room labeled OG and Mexico, uh, you're going to prep as opposition in the room labeled OO. Everybody got that? Any questions? Perfect, thank you. Cool. No, the debate's going to be in this room, right? Yes, the debate's going to be in the general chat Perfect. Um, after 20 minutes. So it is five past. The debate will start at half past seven. Your motion is... This House believes that the United Nations should prioritize the sustainable development goal of, a qu of quality education over no poverty to achieve generation equality by 2030. So it's quality education over no poverty. Does everybody have that? Any questions from the debaters? Question of clarity? Cool. The motion before the House is, this House believes that the UN should prioritize the SDG of quality education over no poverty to achieve generation equality by 2030. I'd like to introduce the first speaker. I'd like to introduce the first speaker from Proposition to open up the debate. Here, here. Um, also, speakers, please feel free to share video wherever possible. Can everyone hear me? Just checking. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, so, okay, cool. So, uh, seven minutes. I can hope this works. Okay, can you see me as well? I hope. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I've got my timer here, so I'm just going to use that to time myself. Okay, I'll begin. <clears throat> As Nura Baroba, the uh, vice president of Sweden's youth organization, has said and spoke at the UN Youth Conference for 2030, we need a system change, not climate change. So let's get more young women into politics. Today, I'd like to start today's debate by contextualizing a little bit the current situations which we're facing and what the UN as an organization needs to address. We've seen in the last year alone with COVID present that hundreds of millions of people have lost jobs this year. And for the 1.6 billion people globally that are already living on the margins of the world, these people have been pushed further into an area of um, crises and into a region of um, worry for their own health and their own safety. Now we see more people every day living on less than a dollar. And particularly, we see more women who are vulnerable as they largely become the shock absorbers of society. What we see for this is that more women every day are abused, more young girls are being sold into child marriages, and we see more girls as well dropping out of schools. Now what we see here is that we need a targeted and strategic plan um, to assist the United Nations in achieving their sustainable development goals for 2030. And for this reason, we are proud to propose. Now, speakers, panel and house, as the first speaker of side proposition, I'm just gonna break down what my roles will be today as this first speaker. So firstly, I'm gonna be doing definitions and defining the motion that we have. Secondly, I'm going to be giving a case split of what I will be speaking of, the two points, and what my second speaker will be speaking on. Um, I'll be stating our burden of proof. And thirdly, I'll be giving, um, and then I'll be uh, elaborating on our team's arguments. Now, firstly, I'd like to look at definitions. So in the motion, we were given um, that this house, as the UN, would prioritize these sustainable development goals or SDGs. Now, these goals are a list of 17 goals which were created by the UN in 2015 for 
2030, and they essentially have a global reach. It's an initiative to, for a global community. Now, these goals incorporate both the Millennial Development Goals, which are specifically for developing countries, as well as some of the other goals of the United Nations to create a holistic approach to addressing for both developed and developing countries some of the major issues that our planet is facing. And these goals are basically a nationally owned and country led project. So each country has the autonomy to decide how they would like to follow through with these goals. Now, secondly, we were also asked to show how prioritizing education will reach generation equality. Now, generation equality is essentially a campaign designed to demand the equality for women. And this um, specifically is for equal pay, healthcare and reproductive rights, political decision making, and essentially also realizing some of fun the fundamental women's rights. Now today, as our burden of proof, we would like to show you that prioritizing education will equip women with, op with the ability to further themselves and their current positions in life and give them opportunities to break structural gender barriers. We would like to show how they become more effective leaders by prioritizing education and uplifting other women. We would like to show how this initiative actually creates platforms and social movements which contribute actually to the other sustainable development goals, which helps to address those goals, such as poverty, such as water and sanitation. And thirdly, how prioritizing education means that different spheres of society and essentially create accountability for their actions and to move forward with this. And so if we manage to achieve this, then we will feel we will have further successfully and further um, sort of um, addressed this um, sustainable, uh, sorry, this uh, initiative at hand, which is to prioritize the um, the generation equality movement. Apologies. Okay, now that I've done my burden of proof, I'd like to t talk about the points we will say today. The first point that I will be speaking on is independence, um, which has two points under which says that this motion will enable independence both of government and secondly independence for the self. Secondly, I will be talking about how this priorita prioritizing women's initiatives allows for platforms and social me and social movements. And thirdly, leading to intersectionality. My second speaker will speak about how getting rid of poverty itself is an unfeasible task and needs to be broken down into smaller parts and how this is a reasonable and realistic approach. Now for my first point, prioritizing education produces independence. I'd like to talk about how this takes off pressure from the government. Firstly, educating young women takes shifts essentially, um, you know, allowing both a male and a female to achieve um, an adequate education to get a decent job actually shifts majority of people from low income to middle income households, which means more people have income. And this is important because it mitigates poverty. It doesn't try and um, address, you know, poverty that's already in existence and just throw money at the issue. It tries to mitigate this. Now, secondly, what we have is private involvement means we have guaranteed services coming through, but it also, we can also see this becoming cheaper because it calls on to these private companies to be involved and to reduce their costs for education. Now, we see that with long running failed service delivery, we need to essentially scrap government involvement and really prioritize having education as a focal point. And we see that we can, if every man and woman has their own job, then they can alleviate their own poverty. And we can see that on a large scale, this becomes incredibly effective. We see how valuable it is for people to be able to uplift themselves. Now, secondly, this also results in something self-sustaining for women because there's an urgency for women to become self-sustaining. And this stems if we give them directly education. Now, the roles for women in the urban area, in the rural area, means that they often have to collect 
fuel and water and they aren't actually given the opportunities to further themselves but with educating women we see they are able to develop to get a proper education and they're able to move out of the informal sector but i see my time has run out today so i'll ask my second speaker to carry on with these points thank you Um, thank you for that speech from the first speaker uh, side proposition. I'd like to call the first speaker from opposition to open up their case. Hello everyone, am I audible? Yes. Perfect. Okay, um, if there is like something that um, because of the um, video transmission, my audio is messed up, please just tell me in the chat. I'll be paying attention to that. Okay, so let's start in three, two, one. Panel, please note that there are two important framings that are going to make opposition win this debate. First, we need to understand the urgency of the matter of solving poverty. Because one, 70% of the, of the world's poor are women, which means that this is an urgent matter to solve this problem for women. Because even if we address quality of education, the problem is that if women that are actually living in poverty cannot access fully these kind of um, possibilities because of poverty, because poverty generates traps, because poverty generates the inability to access freedom for women, this means that quality of education is not something that we ought to strive for first, but we ought to strive second, first solving poverty, then solving other problems that are much, much bigger within the scenario that we're going to present. Second, we believe that gender equality is intersectional. Gender equality is not just for privileged women, but also for underprivileged women that live in rural and marginal areas that are often 10 times more vulnerable than women that live in cities, for example, or urban areas. Meaning that if we actually give quality of education, we often need to strive to actually give quality of education, but also to women that go for example, in areas that are rural, but we cannot do this without solving poverty because poverty generates traps, poverty generates the inability to access income, and for example, the need for women to stay at home and for example, care for their children that often rely on sickness because of the inability to access water or clean uh, or sanitation, for example, that often translates into poverty traps. We believe that those situations are things that we need to solve first. So the first argument from upside is um, making, uh, uh, it's understanding how ineffective, for example, um, measures that are bigger um, um, are for, for solving poverty without first steps. So let's get into the reasoning. First, we know, know that the ability of people that live in the institution to access to other opportunities or to access opportunities in general is reliant on the fact that they're covering their basic necessities. For example, this is reliant to, for example, the, the, the development term of, for example, poverty traps. Why poverty traps are relevant? Poverty traps are often um, defined, for example, as the inability of people to relieve poverty because of a structural and income situations that do not allow them to get out of poverty. This problem is often translated also into women because they are often, for example, that they're often from cultural and social reasons reliant on caretaking work in the household and does not allow them, for example, to access other types of abilities in, in these kind of situations. But for example, examples of poverty traps are sicknesses, like for example, malaria in certain parts of Africa, that when a children or the husband or the, the women in the house get sick, often what the, 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 the situation ends up being is for example, the inability to access income and often acquiring debt to actually get better or, or to actually um, cure individuals that are going, getting sick in the household, but also, for example, the inability to access income or having low pay, low paying jobs that in that in that inability, for example, children to go to school because they need to, for example, go to um, to work um, and, and actually bring more income to the house so people can, for example, do not die from starvation. These kind of scenarios are actually necessary 
to solve before accessing quality of education for any individual in the world, but mostly for women that often rely on oppression within certain spaces. First, so for example, why, what are the mechanisms or the reasons to understand that this is something that is relevant? When you solve poverty or you try to solve poverty, often you allow people to leave poverty traps. And these, for example, can be reliant on two things. One, poverty often functions as a disease. One, this is something that it's um, um, developed and argumented by John Cassidy. But often, for example, when pregnant women are having children and are living processes of anxiety because they cannot have, for example, access jobs, but also, for example, they cannot access um, like quality water or quality food to their children. Often this leads to anxiety process that develop into a biological pattern that do not allow children to develop. But also malnourishment when you're a children often translates into a biological poverty trap in which the development of children is not currently accessible. And for example, they can, even if they have the best education possible, it is, un, it is impossible for them to be good at these kind of spaces because of they were malnourished when they were children or often the, their, um, their pregnant uh, mothers often have anxiety process that translated into biological um, situations that did not allow these children to take advantage of education. Second, this is a definition from Amartya Sen in development. Development should be considered as freedom. And what we understand when we understand, for example, capabilities, this means that capabilities is the, the people's ability to, for example, achieve certain beings. For example, being well nourished, being um, able to go to school, being able to acquire income, etc., etc. But you need to understand that for these beings to actually increase, you need to have the possibility of covering the first beings, which is being well nourished, being not poor. These kind of scenarios are only available, for example, when you leave these kind of situations in which people are often 10 times more oppressed than people that are in cities, for example, and have much more access to other kind of possibilities or beings within the center. The scenario. So when we understand this, we understand that policies that go beyond um, poverty or solving poverty first are often ineffective because people cannot take advantage of those kind of situations if they do not take first, for example, advantage of not being poor or they can actually be able to leave poverty traps. Second argument, which is really important, is that often, Wait, for example, time. these kind of goals are micro goals. Sorry, I think that the time for POIs is over. Um, but um, micro goals are often better than macro questions. When we actually understand that, for example, when we try to solve poverty, the, for example, Banerjee and the flow, which are Nobel laureates, often describe, for example, processes such as randomized control trials that open and out, for example, to test in, in society, how, for example, people by solving certain specific stuff that they're suffering and that, that, that it's turning them to poverty traps, for example, malaria and sickness, is far more effective than other kinds of answering uh, like these enormous questions for development that are often impossible to answer because they're too big or they're really um, as, as they're really non um, tangible to understand like for example quality of education mostly when for example states are the ones that are reliant on taking advantage of for example the policy education and it's not something that it's replicable in every country i think micro goals are often more replicable and then therefore more effective and for example, this will allow people to enter an, equi an equitable society better in the whole world. That is why we're really, really glad to oppose. Cool, cool. Um, thank you for that speech from the first speaker of opposition. I'd like to call the second speaker from proposition to further their case. Hi everyone. Can everyone hear me? Hope you can. Yes. Okay, can I start? Yes, whenever you're ready. Okay. Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And I cannot say that I do not agree with him. There are many causes of global poverty. One factor that stands out is education. There is no way that we can get rid of all 
poverty, especially by 2030. So we should focus on things that will have definite structural changes that will last for a long time, such as education. There are more women on earth than men. If we could get more women educated, a lot more women could dodge these poverty traps. Women cannot be dependent on the government because governments prioritize poverty already. And all these things will still not be solved that was spoken by the first speaker. Women still cannot access schools, institutions, and do institutions don't exist. And there is no cultural shift to the importance of education. Women cannot be conformed to the standards of 1958 where they are expected to stay at home to care for children. Why aren't men playing a role here? It is up to the, well, sorry. Okay. It is up to the private sector to help governments as well as the next generation of leaders to get a head start in helping the global economy to grow again. So to minimize other problems that the sustainable development goals of the UN are trying to tackle. The type of work that we are doing now in some industries will not be the same in 10 years time. Some industries might even be obsolete by then. This creates a great opportunity for new jobs to be created where more women and more women can be involved and people that are in poverty currently. And this can only be done through education. What would happen if the private sector was more involved in education? Private investments can provide better infrastructure and better quality education through commercialization of commercialization, sorry, of education, as there are many financial constraints to government, com government institutions, private sectors can solve the problem of the quality of education. And that is all I have. <laughs> Um, all right, and um, thank you for um, the second speaker uh, side proposition. I'd like to call the second speaker from side opposition. Okay, this is an audio test. Can anyone hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, I would really rather not uh, turn on my camera because of, uh, well, internet and matters. So, said that, I am going to request POIs to be asked uh, through chat so we can all, like, I can keep on being listened. So that, I will begin my speech in three, two, one. Okay, so let's just go over the debate uh, very quickly, okay? So basically we have the burden of proposition steam, which is in which world we can equip women with better tools to break down barriers, gender barriers, right? And what they're telling to us is that the best way to actually equip women is to prioritize education over anything else, specifically over goals such as ending poverty. Now, realize something. When you prioritize something, when you prioritize education over uh, mechanisms to stop poverty, you are basically disregarding the measures for poverty. You're focusing on something in a specific. However, I believe there's someone with a mic on. Uh, however, when you um, when you take into account that opposition doesn't have to actually prioritize poverty, we realize that the benefit of well, the argument of the proposition team that says that education is important is not completely disregarding our side. We do not have to stop educating people. We just don't have to prioritize it over poverty. But actually, you must realize that in order for education to work, in order for the goals of proposition to actually become real, in order for education to actually mean something, we need to guarantee that people can access it in the first place. So the burden of opposition team is to prove that that prioritization is not the best way to equip women, but actually we can prove to you that the best way to equip women is to actually first end poverty and then guarantee an access to it, to education. As uh, yeah, I'll take it. What you, what is um, opposition's position on the fact that it seems by evidence of state practice that poverty is being prioritized with the means of social grants, etc. But that hasn't changed any situation. These policy caps still exist within the status quo and will continue okay. to exist. 
Okay, the position of opposition in that matter is that we are, if there is a prioritization of poverty, it is because it is most, it, it is, okay, this is a process, people. When we want to, to equip women with tools to stop gender inequality, we need to understand that we need to have a process. This process has to follow an order. And that order is, we first, as Ruben told you, have to grant them with the capabilities, but also have to grant them with the functionings. It doesn't matter if a woman knows that she is being oppressed, if she doesn't have the means, speaking about economical means, to actually get uh, get out of that abuse, for example. So it is because of the, of the necessity of those functionings that we need to understand that we first need to stop poverty in order for them to actually be able to be equipped in the first place. If we follow with an alley of tools, we first have to give them the money to buy those tools. We first need to grant, grant them money in order to access that education. And I believe that there is a a very interesting point in the second speaker in the second speech of proposition when they say that basically uh, it is up to the private sector to uh, take care of a country's problem, which basically leads me to understand that what they want is private education, which costs money. So, it, yeah, th there is that there uh, rebutting that idea. They also say that that we need more jobs, that the only way to actually have more jobs is only through education. I believe that in order as I as, have as, as, as I've said so many times before, in order to force people to access that education, there is a need for resources. There is a need for an income. Said that, and following with the case of opposition, I will now uh, present the third speech, which is how we have these redistributive policies of resources that actually uh, uh, are related with intersectionality, which is one of the matters at hand mentioned by the proposition as well. So. Notice how the mechanisms for ending poverty usually require two things. The first one is redistribution of resources, and the second one is a focus on vulnerable groups. If I want as a country to alleviate extreme poverty, I have to first identify where that extreme poverty exists. And as the proposition said, that is usually uh, probably in rural areas instead of urban areas. When we're talking about developing countries uh, specifically, then we will realize that there is a tendency to find vulnerable people in those rural areas that, because of intersectionality, are more vulnerable than others. By this, I mean it's not the same to talk about a man in that rural area than a woman in that rural area. Take, for example, countries that are uh, dedicated to manufacturing clothing. Women and children are more uh, likely to be abused in those uh, countries rather than men. Therefore, we can realize that in these uh, areas, there is more vulnerability for some groups than from others. But realizing that, a government will probably acknowledge the urgency that we're talking about of fighting poverty in those areas, but most specifically of those vulnerable groups. When doing that, they will create mechanisms that will focus on aiding those people in a specific. For example, what was, uh, a law that was created here in Mexico was this sort of government uh, of government aid that was given specifically to women as a salary. It was called a pink salary, which is a very polemical name, but we will not get into that. Uh, it was a pink salary that it was given for women because the government acknowledged that women were more vulnerable in such scenarios. Those mechanisms are, as Ruben was telling you, easier to replicate because they focus on the little people and help them uh, get out of poverty so that they can then access the mechanisms the proposition wants to prioritize. However, when we realize that by first giving those resources, we facilitate the access to those mechanisms in the first place, there is no need to prioritize the mechanisms of the proposition because we already facilitated the access without that prioritization. And it's because of that that we can actually, with this redistribution of, of resources, guarantee more access for more people uh, in for these uh, uh, yeah for these mechanisms that proposition wants to propose. Not only that, but notice that there is an exclusive benefit for opposition that go, that proposition does not have, and that is that when we talk about the mechanisms for great things such as educating a whole nation, we realize that those mechanisms will probably start in urban areas and then expand very slowly towards rural areas. Therefore, the mechanisms of proposition will be more intersectional and take more time to actually support the people that are most vulnerable because of the same nature of those mechanisms. Whereas when I focus on this the small people, the most vulnerable people on rural areas, it is more likely that they are helped. And by that, by acknowledging that the most vulnerable group are women, I can therefore 
uh, relieve the symptoms of this. Ah, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. I can really, I can uh, help uh, women easily than a proposition will. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that speech from the second speaker of opposition. I'd like to call the third speaker from proposi proposition to close their case. Can I just check if I am audible and visible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Perfect. Well, let me tell you of the story of rural India's Neha Lal. Neha raises, rises at 5 a.m. every morning. She then proceeds to cook food for her family and mother her siblings. Neha is 11 years old. Neha belongs in school. Here at oh, the panel, my name is Janine Replay and I am third speaker for the proposition. And in doing such, I will first elaborate on my rebuttal against the opposition and then conclude with a summation of our case. Your Excellencies, uh, rather panel, um, it is quite clear today that there is an agreement between proposition and opposition that poor women are the most vulnerable of society. The question then becomes, what aids these women and most importantly, what aids these women most quickly as we must keep in mind that the sustainable development goals are that of 2030. What is important for the panel to um, remember that is that when we look at the most um, uneducated of society or those who are impacted most when, educated, when education rather is not prioritized, at the end of the day, that is women. And so necessarily by prioritizing education, we prioritize women and we prioritize moving them out of the lower echelons of society and up into the middle class where they are able to provide for themselves. Your Excellencies, or our panel, um, I believe that there's a POI, which I'm willing to take. Yes. Um, the story that you tell at the beginning of your speech is exactly why we need to solve poverty first, because Nia, it's impossible for her to go to a quality of education school if they actually, if she actually still is in, inherent to, for example, to leave their house in the private space because she's poor and she needs to help the house to let their family, for example, develop or have the, mean, the, the meaningful part of development for them to actually carry on when they're poor and they're living in destitution. Yes, thank you. That is precisely my first point of rebuttal, right? So this idea of a poverty trap, women simply don't have access to the basic resources, and so education is simply useless. Panel, that is the status quo of today. We've seen governments time and time again prioritize social grants, trying to uplift societies, and yet people still aren't having or don't have the ability to leave their homes and get educated. The issue here is that governments are simply don't have the resources and are simply, simply ill-equipped to move women out of those spaces. And so it's important that we give them the tools, give them the institutions to move themselves out of those cases on their own. So why is it that government, governments fail? Two reasons. First, that institutions for education in themselves simply do not exist again, because of the lack of resources. Or two, if they do exist, why are the Nehas of India still sitting in the kitchen? It's because we need a cultural shift prioritizing education. Patriarchy is still an overwhelming one that infiltrates all of our systems and our communities. And so when we have big bodies like the UN forcing governments, forcing communities and private institutions collectively to prioritize education and move women and children out of the kitchen and into a classroom, this is when we see a real shift and a real change um, in alleviating poverty. Because it is not that education or prioritizing education is opposed or diametrically opposite to that of the goal of po poverty, but rather that education is the tool and the key that is necessary to alleviating poverty. 
And on that point, your panel, it's quite obvious then that proposition is not bigoted. We do not agree with um, the opposition in that this policy kind of targets middle class women or modern women, but rather that this is what is necessary for those who are the most vulnerable of society, women in the most poorest areas. Panel, the second point of rebuttal is then this idea that quality of education is simply not a tangible or a measurable goal, and so it's not really something that should be pursued. This is this can't sit well in this house, especially when the exact same thing can be said about the goal of poverty. It's simply an unrealistic one, uh, quite clearly by the by the time of 2030, and is extremely vague. In fact, the UN has time and time again been criticized for setting the threshold um, for someone who isn't poor to have an income of $1.25. Studies time and time again have shown that at least $5 is a necessary one or a livable um, daily income in order for people to not be poor anymore. The reason why the threshold is set so low at $1.25 is simply because there's a rush to try and meet this goal in the short time given and so we're seeing a superficial change rather than a meaningful one and the and so proposition would rather have us do an institutional change by investing in women's education and by in doing so then reduce poverty in the long term and have a realistic change of having people hopefully have over five dollars a day in their pocket um, this brings me to then the last point of rebuttal, um, and that being the inclusion of private industry. It's quite obvious um, that at the moment, states are not socialist ones. We don't have governments simply handing out access to water, food, and sanitation. And this is for many reasons, political ones, the fact that there simply aren't enough resources. Um, and so when we prioritize education, we upon the private um, institutions to stop um, abusing the capitalist system and rather get involved and provide for the lowest of society. When we have an increase in the market of private institutions and private education, we will see the cost of education being lowered and more accessible to vulnerable women. And so this also um, puts pressure on government um, to try and be involved, but if they cannot, as we've seen in the past, governments often evade their socioeconomic um, responsibilities, will have private institutions be involved and assist. Um, as I see, my, my time is about to elapse. Your, your panel, it must be noted that due to COVID-19, at least 1.5 billion um, children have had to leave school, as indicated in the UN 2020 report on SDG. Um, SDG or Sustainable Development Goals rather. And so it is important now more than ever that we prioritize the education of women, not just by governments, but within communities and shift the culture of patriarchy away so that women are enabled, self-empowered and become the vehicles of sustainable change for future generations. Thank you to the third speaker of Proposition for that speech. I'd like to call the third speaker from Opposition to close off the debate. Yep, uh, can you hear me? I'm going to turn on my video. Just let me see if I don't get stuck because of the internet. Uh, oh my god, okay, there. Can you listen to me? Yeah. Yep, you're audible, thanks. Okay, great. So I'm just going to put my timer and then I will begin. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. So one last thing before I begin is that I'm super happy to be able to be here debating with people from other countries. I wouldn't have thought that I would be doing this uh, uh, when I was like three years ago. So yeah, super stoked to be here. Um. Yeah, so I will be in three, two, one. If I need to carry about my, my family, about my sisters and brothers, and about my parents, 
because I am the only one and I am the one who is forced to do so because we don't have access to money, it is much less likely that I will have uh, a priority in education because I, will, I don't need education, I need to survive. This is the main problematic that we have uh, when we face the case of, of team proposition and it's that they simply assume that education it will be for granted and that everybody will be able to go for it and that it will solve everything because it will imply a cultural change that will be given through this education. We believe that this is not a way that this is not what is going to happen because of the various different reasons which are already shown in the characterization that they have brought, uh, during their arguments. So during this the, during this speech, I will show you why their characterizations are rebuttals to their own cases and how their case cannot happen without having solved poverty first, and why poverty is much a much better uh, and sustainable goal than simply uh, thinking of education. So let's begin with the first part and the most important part, and is that they, as they mentioned, uh, the UN is not a binding uh, a binding IGO, but rather just. Uh, an IGO which states what should be done and what should not be done. Therefore, any country, given the sovereignty of each country, is in, is in its capacity to decide how to tackle the problems or even if they want to tackle them and on, on what order. Therefore, that means that if, uh, that if countries want to do something uh, just to have the numbers or just to complete uh, the, the goal to be like, I, I was the first country to complete the goal, they can do it in any way. This means that, for example, if my goal is to prioritize education, I can simply go ahead and make a lot of schools in everywhere in, in, in the in the country. And I will say, therefore, I have schools everywhere. I have quality of education everywhere. And therefore, I have solved the quality of education problem, right? The problem right here is that even if that is true, that the thing is that most people don't have, still don't have access because of two, to education because of two reasons. Firstly, they don't have access because schools are far away from their houses, as as it happens to many indigenous, uh, and to many indigenous people, or they are simply not capable of going there because in the end, education is is a right, but it's not an obligation. Which means that people can not, can stop going to, to, to the school if that's what they want to do, if that's what they want, if that's not what they want to prioritize. This, this means that that even if we accept that the characterization that was brought through team proposition, we understand that it is very unlikely that state that states will do a, a very sustainable job of doing uh, of, of, of achieving education because of this non-binding part of the UN. And this this is the this is the, the the same reason why poverty is actually going to be uh, achieved because of the same factor. Because in the end, you can't solve poverty simply by saying I'll give money for everyone. Because poverty is a problem which which is multidimensional, which means that it's caused by many different parts and many different factors, which are factor in to create that the poverty therefore it means that poverty is uh, is created by the lack of money and the lack of access to to the house but it is perpetuated by other means such as the lack of uh, education such as the lack to access to public health and other other problematics that are not just simply i don't have enough money which means that if countries want to solve poverty and be like i want to be the first country which solve poverty they are going to simply going they are going to have to tackle other the other problematics and have a sustainable way of keeping uh, uh, social mobilization uh, because in other ways they are not going to be able to achieve uh, this goal. This means that intrinsically our side is going to be more likely to succeed because governments have more tasks to do in order in order to complete it and they are uh, they are forced to do it in a sustainable way because in in another way it just won't be happening more. Uh, in this scenario, we can understand that. Uh, give a moment. Uh, in this uh, in this scenario, we can understand that. Therefore, if uh, we can solve poverty um, to a more sustainable way, it is more likely that women are going to be benefited from from this. Because in the end, even if education is what allows them to notice that they are being uh, that they are being oppressed in any way. It is also true that there are other ways of doing so. For example, if I am not poor and therefore I can get out of my echo camber in, inside my house and I can listen to other people and I can I can have the the media and I can have social media and other stuff inside uh, inside of or around me, it means that I can therefore 
have more access to a different way of thinking and I can still change and notice these sorts of oppressions. But before I continue, uh, please point of, of information. I can both agree that governments are simply unwilling or ill-resourced to assist in both endeavors, right? But the issue is that where you help with poverty specifically and only, individuals become reliant on the same government that cannot provide for them long term. Whereas when you enable them with education, they have the tools to provide for themselves in the future. What is your position? Yes, of course, we, we can see that happening. But the thing is that even if we just prioritize education and we go, yes, let's go for education. In the end, what will happen if I don't have the access to 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 food? If I don't have the, the capacity to, have, to go uh, to have, for example, my parents working and therefore I have to work, I can't access, I can't go to school because I need to help, I need to be there. And given the narratives of the patriarchal uh, society, it is much more likely that women are going to be the ones who have to, to be there. So even if we prioritize quality of education, it doesn't mean that women are going to be able to go there because there will still be these problematics that won't, won't be happening. And yes, we may not be able to solve po poverty in its total, but in the end, it's much more better that we can help as many people as we can than that than not help than just saying like we we have education yay so in the end which are which are the main clash points and which are the reasons that the uh, team opposition won basically ren already told you how is that poverty isn't is equal to not being able to access education and how this means that uh, that all the, the parts that proposition has said are less likely to happen. And secondly, uh, he explained us how, how these, uh, the goal of poverty, as I already mentioned in my rebuttal, is a better way of achieving uh, education. And Malo already showed you how is it that our process is much more better for solving uh, inequality between genders and the problematics that perpetuate uh, gender inequality. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, cool. Sorry about all of that. I think we're ready to start giving um, feedback on the debate. Uh, am I audible? And visible. Cool. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for this debate. It was very mat and hence and a very good debate. So I'm going to do a very in-depth feedback um, in 15 minutes because I just want to run through like as much as possible so you can see how we saw the debate from um, our side as adjudicators, but also because it's, we're not really going to get like personal feedback or anything like that. So yeah, just taking the opportunity to then uh, give tips as well. Yeah, so um, we start this debate with a very good context from um, the proposition side and uh, you want winners first, I'll come back to them. <laughs> um, so no, actually, let me give winners first because as I explain, I'm going to give it away. And I yeah, don't need that <laughs> stress. So cool. Um, so main reasons we think that the winning side won is because they were, I think, more strategic in how they presented the, the matter that we got in this debate, which ended up making it easier for us as adjudicators to see the value of prioritizing their goal um, over the other one, but also that we were able to, I think, they were able to situate themselves in the debate strategically. Let me get into the rest. Our winners are Mexico from opposition side. Congratulations. So why we gave the debate to Mexico? We get a really great context from proposition when they start the debate um, by telling us about why the UN needs to focus on this, these goals, why there's this urgency for the next 10 years or nine years that needs to have something big achieved um, and that our most vulnerable actors are women. That context and characterization remains pretty much throughout the debate, right? So what we see is a focus on one achievement, the urgency and the time, and I think two, the solution. And what we get from opposition that's really nice is this comprehensive analysis of like the multi-layered approach that you can take to tackling poverty that I think on top of like the other issues that'll come up, that multi-layered solution, that community-based analysis, I think it's able to show us then why eradicating 
and poverty in the short time, even though we haven't done that because we get a good um, POIs from a proposition side that say like governments fail and they fail quite often as we all know so why should we then move to this and i think that that's why the solution that we get then from um, proposition side is this private sector involvement this broad-based community everybody's in it the government um, private sector and we're going to have better education, but I think we fail to see or we fail to get any kind of analysis for what steps they take after that. So cool private institutions are involved, cool governments involved, everybody cares about education, but we don't really get to see um, or we don't get any analysis on what those steps are or what it looks in the in-between. We just have this idea that education is a key tool and accessing it is what's going to change everything, right? One, then we get a nice rebuttal from opposition side that um, is, was very persuasive in that um, you're not really going to be able to access it. So no matter how many schools you build and no matter um, who gets involved and um, how it plays on the cost of education, at the end of the day, when your family doesn't have food, you're probably going to have to go to work rather and you'd choose to go to work rather because you don't have food either and th in that situation poverty becomes yeah a trap and it does it blocks access to the other goals so the other nice thing that we then got was this idea that uplifting poverty and I, we saw it play on this from both sides which i think was great given the motion that at the end of the day if you prioritize this you will, all these goals kind of work together and we saw just fragments of that idea that cool, if you get to this key to education, you will eventually uplift yourself out of poverty. But um, what we get from the opposition side, this idea, one, that uplifting yourself is something you need the means to do, is something you need the freedom to do, you need the autonomy to do, you need the agency to do, um, and being able to even shift cultural perspectives is something that you need basic agency to be able to do and the and tying their entire case into that basic agency and freedom was something we really appreciated and that came from seeing that cool all these goals work together and the way that opposition saw them working together was that once you have your basic minimums met you're able to like go into the world as a actual human being and maybe take advantage of education or find a decent work all those other in-betweens and that we can think about but with education we don't really get we have this idea and I guess, yeah, Nelson Mandela did tell us education is the key to um, alleviating poverty, but we don't get any then mechanisms. So it's all on the individual all the time if they read their books and they pick themselves up. So then we start to wonder where does the UN factor in and why do we then want them to get involved and how do they get involved if they're going to be bigger institutions? So it was just strategic flaws like that. If they're going to come with bigger institutions, how do we up end up uplifting the individual? But also at the same time, this thing is targeted to the individual only. You see? So that was kind of some of the strategic flaws that ran throughout Prop's case that ended up, uh, that also just ended up having the debate way more towards, prop um, towards opposition. And yeah, I think lastly, it's just that the small community and the survival before anything else that were very convincing in this debate, and we really appreciated that argumentation. Oh, thank you. Cool. So that's feedback. Um, and then I'm just going to do closing from our side as World Speech Day. Um, but first, actually, any questions on the feedback before we close all of that? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, cool. Then from our side at World Speech Day, we really do appreciate you guys taking the time, the hours out of your day to come and just express yourself and have a chance to have a say. These recordings are going to be available um, on the WSD World Speech Day South Africa YouTube channel later in the week. So please look out for it around there and watch yourself speak. You guys were really, really good all around. And it was a very entertaining debate to watch and adjudicate even. I really do appreciate you guys coming through. Thank you so much. And special thank you to Benjamin, or Benjamin, sorry, 
for bringing and helping me organize tonight. Okay, good night. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Everything. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.